So uh, I'm very delighted to, to welcome you and uh, also to welcome uh, so my two colleagues uh, who are um, specialized in bioethics uh, of the Columbia University. And it's a great opportunity to, um, uh, in this partnership between uh, Columbia University, uh, these global centers, and uh, the French School of Public Health, so École des Hautes Études en Santé Publique. Uh, first, uh, I want to, to present you maybe um, Robert. So uh, maybe <laughs> you can present you. So Dr. Robert Kitzman, uh, Robert, you are a professor in clinical psychiatry in, the, uh, in two institutions. So uh, in the College of Physicians and Surgeons and in the Melville School of Public Health, uh, so in New York City. And uh, you are also, it's interesting for training, uh, of a you are the director of the Masters of Biotics program in presence and in online. Uh, at Columbia University. So uh, I will let you give more details uh, about your biography because uh, it, I think it will be interesting. And David, <laughs> David Hoffman, uh, you are, so you have a lot of quality because you are a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> um, you are a healthcare attorney and clinical ethicist. Um, I think it's very interesting to, to explain uh, us what, uh, what is the specificity of this uh, profession, mission, mm -hmm. function, I don't know. You will explain. You are also lecturers in bioethics in different master, including uh, the master of um, program. So, uh, we so, uh, for um, for today, it's uh, the first conference, and we have another one uh, only with uh, Robert uh, on Wednesday at six o'clock. But today, it's um, the aim is to present uh, an overview about uh, bioethics in the United States. And uh, I liked your expression. <laughs> you, you wanted to talk about the best and the worst of bioethics in the US. So um, it would be interesting to, to um, sp speak about that. And um, it's also a very great opportunity because you know that in France, um, we are in the very specific uh, period of the revision of the bioethics law. And it's really a pleasure to do this conference in presence of, uh, we are very honored to have <laughs> the presence of Jean-François Delfrécy, um, the president of the uh, French National Committee of Ethics, and uh, also Marie-Christine Simon, uh, who works in the team, and uh, also with Fabrice. I, I just tell the people who I know, <laughs> Fabrice uh, Exil, who um, uh, we will have a meeting uh, with, with you. And uh, you, you work in the Foundation of Alzheimer's Disease, and uh, you, you also are very interesting about um, ethical question. Uh, just a, a little. Um, uh, two, two words about uh, the, the second, um, the second uh, conference uh, that takes place on Wednesday. It will be about the, um, uh, the topics on baby à la carte. <laughs> <laughs> baby à la carte, so the designing babies, how technology is changing the ways that we create children. So, the baby à la carte, <coughs> it's a uh, baby à la carte and procreation. I, I think you, you will uh, also speak about uh, procreation in general. And during the um, Bioethics Forum, les états généraux de la bioéthique, um, we spoke about uh, nine uh, main topics, including uh, a lot of topics we will uh, speak about. So, I let you <laughs> the place. Yes, thank you. Oh. Merci beaucoup, Karine et Laurent et toutes les autres uh, personnes ici. Uh, it's a really a, a pleasure and an honor to be here and to have a chance to talk with you uh, tonight. And uh, I'm going to be talking about bioethics in the United States, an overview of policy and impacts of professional practice. And I'm going to give a bit of an overview and talk about a few topics. And then David is going to dive more deeply on a few other topics as well. And Issues of bioethics have been in the news, in the media, for many years, uh, increasingly so. There are questions about genes, how much of social traits, such as intelligence, may be genetic or not. 
Uh, there are issues about embryonic stem cell research, and these are very much issues that are in the public square, as we say. These are issues that people are discussing in newspapers and TV, issues that the public is concerned about. There are issues about research. Uh, are we creating human guinea pigs? Do people want to be in research studies, uh, et cetera? Uh, and uh, I'm going to give you a very brief overview of how we look at these issues in the United States, uh, in which there are some, there are many, many similarities with France, also important uh, points of difference, and how the process works that I think are instructive uh, uh, for both, for both uh, countries and other countries as well. The modern history of bioethics in the United States really started here in Europe. In Auschwitz, uh, there were horrific experiments that were done by Nazi doctors. So Nazi doctors, for instance, wanted to see how long their troops could last on the Eastern Front fighting Russia in the cold. So they took people in concentration camps and they put them in the cold and measured how long it took for them to die. So there was no informed consent. They had no choice. And it's because of that that after the war, there was, as part of the Nuremberg Tribunals, for the first time, a set of bioethical principles. When you think about it, the Bible, the Ten Commandments, does not talk about bioethics. It did not talk about stem cell research, did not talk about genetics research. These are things that did not exist. The Constitution of the United States and in France were written 200 years ago and did not anticipate or talk about these issues. And yet here we are, because of technology, having to deal with these issues. And one important theme is that technology and science have advanced enormously in the past few years. And with this come all kinds of ethical, legal, and social questions that we as a society must deal with. So the Nuremberg Code said that informed consent is absolutely essential that qualified researchers need to use appropriate research designs. There needs to be a favorable risk-benefit ratio, although what that means is not clear. How much risk is it OK to have in a study? Or how much risk is it OK for a doctor to have in a treatment that he or she is giving to a patient? Participants must be free to stop. And uh, the Nuremberg Code did not address clinical research, uh, but the principles have been expanded from research into other settings. Despite the Nuremberg Code, which was in the 40s, there was in the United States, importantly, a Tuskegee syphilis study that this man led, uh, Dr. Clark. Uh, and he took participants who were African-American men in the South who were semi-illiterate. They did not read or write very much. And they had syphilis. And starting in the 1930s, the government paid for a study that was conducted by researchers at Johns Hopkins University and Harvard and the US government to study the natural course of syphilis in these men, how long it took for syphilis to go into the brain, for instance. The problem is that once penicillin was discovered as the definitive cure for syphilis after World War II, the researchers, such as Dr. Clark, decided not to give penicillin to the men or to tell the men that a cure existed because it would destroy the experiment. If we treated everyone, these men who had syphilis, we would not be able to study how syphilis would eventually kill them. Uh, and this is a nurse who was caught in the middle. She was African-American. And she uh, encouraged the men to stay in the study. Uh, and this is uh, marked a uh, continued on until the 1970s. And it wasn't until 1974 when a journalist broke the story and announced that this had been going on, that these men were not told about potential treatment. And as a result, in 1974, the US government passed the National Research Act that created a national commission for the protection of human subjects of biomedical and behavioral research. And Congress asked them to identify basic ethical principles, to develop guidelines. And this became known as the Belmont Report that was first begun in 1979 uh, and laid out basic ethical principles and guidelines, boundaries between practice and research, uh, and how to apply these. And this has become so-called the Bible of American bioethics. And it lists several basic bioethical principles. One is autonomy or respect for persons, that individuals should not be treated as or should be treated as autonomous agents, not as means to an end, that 
Individuals with diminished autonomy, let's say a patient has Alzheimer's or it's a child, they need added protections. That important principle was do no harm, beneficence, and maximize possible benefits and also minimize potential harms, which many of us think is sort of a separate principle, and a notion of justice, a fair distribution of burdens and benefits of research. But conflicts can arise. People would generally agree on these principles, but the challenges in how to interpret and apply these in different areas. So justice, for instance, can mean that everyone gets the same, or it can mean that those who need more get more, or it can mean that those who contribute more money into the system get more out, and those who contribute less get less out. And these are different notions of justice that uh, come into play when uh, debates happen about, for instance, uh, how much health care the average American should get. Should government give health care to everyone? If so, how much? And these basic principles lead to in consideration uh, and need for informed consent, risk benefit assessments, and selection of research participants. But as I said, these issues extend also into many other areas. So recently there have been bioethical ethical challenges, and again, because of increases in technology, in both clinical settings and research, most research in the United States on human beings is now conducted by industry, by corporations, not by the government. And most of that is actually conducted in the developing world. So just as our cell phones and computers are not made in the United States, and I think probably not much made in France, but they're made in China, they're made in Malaysia, they're made in India, so too most medical research actually is now being done in these other countries, and that raises a large number of ethical issues going into other cultures. But also in clinical domains, in reproduction, in pediatrics, in chronic disease, issues of aging, issues of end-of-life care, uh, these bioethical challenges emerge. And there are cross-cutting areas that I'm going to focus on tonight. One is genomics, and one is concerns electronic records and big data. So genomics can aid and diagnose, in, in, in aid in diagnosis and treatment, I should say, of uh, in many diseases, but most doctors are ill-prepared to discuss testing and disclosure dilemmas with patients. There's a lot of questions about genetics that come up. Who should have access to genetic information? If I, as your doctor, get your genetic information, who should get that information? Can I sell that information? Can I give it to others? If so, when? And there's concerns about discrimination. And the reason genetics is becoming an issue is because of the cost that has dropped. So in 2001, the cost to sequence one person's DNA was $100 million for one person. And since then, over the past 16 years, the price is now about $300. So as the price has gone from $100 million for one person to $300, the number of people who get tested has gone from one person to millions of people. And the price is continuing to go down, as you see. And what that means is that many, many people are going to have genetic information, genetic tests done. And I would argue that we're not prepared to deal with the information. And specifically, all this information raises a lot of ethical questions that we need to begin to think about. One question, does genetic information differ from other health information? And if so, how come? Doctors have your blood pressure, they'll have your sodium level, they'll have other kinds of medical information about you, but genetics may be different because it's permanent. Your blood pressure may change, your sodium level may change, your genetics will never change, although I should say recently there's actually genetic editing, uh, which could potentially, but that's another story. It affects families, not just individuals. If I have your genes, they tell me something about your relatives' genes as well. Uh, in the United States, we have now found criminals because we find their DNA, and we're able to go on a database and find out uh, who is related to this person. We've been able to capture uh, criminals based on their DNA. It can affect the next generation, so it has reproductive implications. Unlike smoking or obesity, it's not one's choice. I didn't choose my genes. So we may say that we may uh, have uh, uh, penalized people who smoke or people who may be overweight in terms of uh, 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 their health care, but we can't do that with genetics. It's new. Uh, there have been misuses of genetics, and it's seen differently. 
privacy is important and privacy in general is important and this comes up also when I will talk about electronic me medical records in a moment. But privacy in general raises issues about use of the internet, Facebook, uh, Big Brother, uh, the National Security Agency, the United States government is busy listening to many people's phone calls. There is hacking of information online. There have been various companies in the U.S. that have been hacked. Uh, there uh, are sales of information. Uh, in the last presidential election, Facebook was selling information to the Trump campaign through Cambridge Analytica. Uh, and companies need to state their policies, but there's still a lot of sale of information. Healthcare privacy is even more of a concern because in the United States, uh, one thing that President Obama did is he required all doctors or incentivized all doctors to put all their medical records in electronic databases. So all the medical records of everyone is on electronic database, which means I can send them to anyone. Uh, 23andMe is a company that for a few hundred dollars will do your genetic testing. It has the genetic results of around one million people and it sells that data on a thumb drive for $60 million to different drug companies. So there, if you join 23andMe, your data is being sold for $60 million. And genetic data with just your zip code can be identifying. There are studies that show that if I have your gene, your, your whole DNA, and I have your zip code, I can figure out who you are. And discrimination could occur and could lead to people not wanting to be tested. There's a lot of uncertainties about genetic testing. Uh, so unlike the slide I showed earlier saying the, uh, uh, um, the IQ gene, uh, it turned, at first scientists thought that there would be a cancer gene, a schizophrenia gene. A gene. It turns out there are many, many genes involved with many, many different <laughs> disorders. Uh, so for most people, genetic tests do not give clinically useful information. If there was a bad gene that led to people dying, evolution would lead to that gene being weeded out. If people wouldn't survive, they wouldn't have children if there was a terrible gene that killed everyone. So there are not that many highly predictive tests which are uh, lethal. Uh, but other results can be important or useful. There's carrier status. So I, if I'm having a child with someone, we uh, may each carry a recessive gene that together may lead to a child having the disease, even though neither of us have the disease. There is an area of pharmacogenomics. That is to say, your genes can determine which drug is best for you. If we all have a certain disease, if we all have a certain cancer, our genetics may say that for you, this gene, drug is best, whereas for someone else, that drug is best. There's ancestry, which in the United States is popular. People want to know where they came from. They came from France, they came from Alsace-Lorraine, or they came from Provence. There's genetic tests that purport to say what part of France uh, you come from, what part of Europe. Uh, there are problems due to multiple comparisons, though, and the fact that a lot of associations have not been replicated. Our, as many of you know, our DNA consists of uh, three billion molecules that are uh, form uh, an alphabet of consisting of four uh, basic uh, proteins. Uh, the, the proteins are abbreviated ACTG, and that combination of ACTG written out three billion times is our genome. Uh, the, uh, what has happened is, uh, for the past 20 years is researchers have looked at uh, small groups of people and said, well, everyone on this half of the room has a certain gene in common. We looked at all three billion genes or, you know, we looked at uh, three billion nucleotides and we found they have a gene in common and this group doesn't. Uh, so if this group, let's say, has a disease, this must be the cause of the disease as they have this gene in common. Uh, however, as of course, uh, what happens is if we look at three billion pieces of information, we're going to find something that this group has that this group doesn't. We will call it the right hand of the room gene, because people who have this gene are sitting on the right hand of the room. <laughs> uh, so, so that's a joke. But um, uh, So uh, because we look for multiple things, there are problems. There are many variants of uncertain significance. So we find that there are many times we find a 
uh, people have an unusual gene. We find a two, three patients have an unusual gene, uh, and we don't know what it means. Uh, they have this disease, but maybe there are other people we haven't found it before. Uh, and so there's a lot of information that's not certain. Uh, there is uh, understanding of prevalence of mutations uh, is based on clinical samples. In other words, we've looked at people who come to the hospital with a certain disease, and we find they have a certain gene. Uh, and we thought that that gene was associated with the disease. But then when we look at the population in general, we find people who have this gene and are perfectly healthy. So we thought that it was a causative gene, but it's not. Uh, many people, uh, and also we think now there are many combinations of genes. There was a, a study that was published about a year ago which uh, looked at all three billion uh, uh, pieces of information and found that there were genes associated with your educational attainment. How far you got in college was associated with having particular genes. I think that's sort of ridiculous. Uh, I think if we look for lots and lots of genes, we may find combinations associated with all kinds of things that may not be genetic, but they're problems. The other problem is discrimination and eugenics. So eugenics, which led to uh, Nazi Germany to say that they wanted to purify the genes of the German population and therefore to get rid of all the Jews, all the homosexuals, all the gypsies, those theories about trying to purify the gene pool of a population, in fact, came from America and reflects our unfortunate racist history. So in the 1920s, in the middle of America, there were eugenics fairs. There would be fairs about to see who can uh, bring in the fattest pig, who can grow the, the, the biggest pumpkin, and who had the best genetics. Uh, and of course, there's still myths. Infidelity, it may be in your genes. This is from a few years ago. British scientists find the fat gene, the God gene. This says, I've got the fat bastard gene. <laughs> so there's a lot of misunderstandings about genes. Uh, everyone has genetic predispositions to certain diseases, maybe just slightly. Mutations can be associated with relative risks, but uh, low increased absolute risk. So there are genes associated with Alzheimer's, for instance, that will triple your risk of having Alzheimer's disease which means that for a particular age, your risk may go from 5% to 15%, or 10% to 30%. So you triple your risk, but the odds are still that you won't get the disease, and people don't understand that. Unfortunately, we only have about 3,000 genetic counselors in the United States. Uh, the U.S. health system does not reimburse genetic counselors, and so they don't get paid. There are very few. I saw that in the document that Karine mentioned, there was mention of the need for genetic counselors, which I think is very important and very good. Uh, uh, so people are changing their understandings of genetics. There's concerns about what we call genetic essentialism, the notion that there is a gene that is the cause of something, rather than understanding that there are environmental factors that may be involved, there may be multiple genes, et cetera. And most physicians feel they need more information. Uh, in research I've done, I wrote a book called Am I My Genes about genetics. Um, I found that people don't understand uh, Mendelian genetics. They don't understand, they feel if they have a gene for disease, they feel they won't get another disease, that lightning only strikes once or doesn't strike twice. They don't understand predictability. They don't understand statistics. Uh, so for instance, Huntington's disease uh, is a terrible disease. If I have it, there's a 50% chance that each of my children will have it. And I've had patients and even some uh, uh, scientists tell me that they are at risk of the disease. And some said, uh, my sister tested positive for Huntington's, and I felt terrible for her. But I was glad because it means that I'm not going to get the disease because she had it, which, of course, is not the way it works. Each, coin is a 50, each, each flip of the coin is 50-50. Etc. And people, this gets tied up with people's emotional states, with their hope, with their desire, their fear, etc. There's concerns about unfair discrimination. So in the U.S., we have a Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, or GINA, that covers health insurance, but does not cover life insurance, long-term care insurance, or disability insurance. So today, if I get a genetic test, life insurance companies can refuse to sell me life insurance. Uh, and that's the law. Uh, what I found in research I've done is that discrimination can be subtle. So there are people who told me, a woman, for instance, said she found she had the gene for breast cancer. She told someone at work. The next thing she knew, everyone came up to her at work and said, how are you? 
The next thing she knew uh, was that it was thought that then when the boss retired, she would become the head of the department. Well, the boss retired and she was not promoted. She wasn't fired, but she wasn't promoted. And she feels this is because of discrimination. We have, there's discrimination based on sex, based on race. And so genetic discrimination, I think, exists. Um, uh, there are concerns about this. Uh, people are concerned not just for themselves, but for their children. If I find I have a gene for Huntington's disease, uh, again, it may affect whether my children can uh, ha get insurance as well. Uh, and testing can cause stress. Uh, so if a woman, for instance, with a history of Huntington's does not want to have testing because there's no treatment and it's often a death sentence, if life insurers say she needs to get tested, she has to undergo testing. But if she turns out not to have the mutation, she would feel devastated, depressed, and unable to get insurance. So this is part of the dilemma that comes up. There are questions of whom to tell. If you have, I find I have a genetic disease. People told me, I don't know, do I tell my children? Do I tell my 15-year-old daughter that I have the breast cancer gene and she may get it and she may die of breast cancer? She's only 15 years old. Is that too much information? Uh, I haven't talked to my sister in years. I hate my sister. I've never talked to her. Do I need to call her up and say, I have the breast cancer gene and you may have it and you should get tested? What are the responsibilities we have to each other? And again, these raise questions. What about long lost relatives? When do you tell? How do you tell, et cetera? And there are, even though there are laws for health insurance, people are nervous. People are afraid. I don't believe the law that it's going to, even when with President Trump, that's a whole other story. Uh, <laughs> but people are afraid that even if in health insurance now is covered, uh, does it not discriminate? What it's going to happen in the future, we don't know. Do you tell your doctors, et cetera? And this is just, I'm sorry for the small size, but I did a study of doctors. Uh, have you counseled patients on genetic issues? 65% yes. Do you want for more information on when to order genetic tests? 78% of doctors say yes. Do you want more information on how to order genetic tests? 82%. How to counsel patients on genetic testing? 82% of doctors want more information. On how to interpret tests? 77% of doctors want more information. So. Doctors are saying we don't have enough information on how to deal with this with genetics. Genetic information should be performed more often. Most doctors, is your knowledge of genetics? These are doctors. Very poor, somewhat poor. Seventy-five percent of doctors said their knowledge of genetics was poor. So I did another study of researchers. What should you tell patients when you are in research studies about genetics? Should you tell them about secondary findings? So let's say I'm in a study for Alzheimer's disease and I get everyone's genetic tests. Should I also look up for breast cancer? If everyone has breast genes associated with breast cancer or genes associated with uh, cardiomyopathy or there are other conditions that are uh, for which there are genes that are actionable that can have a treatment uh, and 92% of researchers said yes you should uh, talk to patients about that should you talk about sharing information yes should you talk about the impact on family relationships yes should you talk about uh, relatives yes should you talk about uh, data security yes penalties for failing to protect the information yes uh, obtaining consent, yes. And then I said, how much time do you think it will take to get consent to do genetic testing? They said about 30 minutes. So if to go through all the information about genetics is going to take much longer than 30 min minutes, to go through all the secondary findings, the possible, if I test you for one thing, uh, should I test you for other things? Should I test you for uh, carrier status? So doctors are not prepared to do the kind of informed consent. We need to come up with models. They could be computer models. They could be having more genetic counselors. But there's a need to educate people. The American College of Medical Genomics and Genetics said that there should be uh, uh, 59 genes that every patient should be tested for when they have genetic testing. These are genes that are highly predictive for a disease, and there is something you can do about it. Uh, the number has changed, but there are questions. Uh, how do, where do you draw the line? Uh, uh, can patients opt out? At first, they said patients cannot opt out. So if you have an infant being genetically tested, you had to test that infant for breast cancer and everything else. They then changed and said they, it, they, there could be an opt out from the parents. 
So clearly there's a lot of issues that come up, uh, and I'm, I thought I'd lay some of these issues out and then we can talk more in the discussion about them. The other area I want to talk about is electronic medical records and artificial intelligence, which can obviously help healthcare and research. I'm going to move a little faster to have time for discussion. Um, but there are questions that come about privacy, confidentiality, data access. Uh, it turns out that on electronic medical records, inaccurate data is often entered. People or doctors are just typing in the their computer when patients come in and some there's a lot of inaccuracies hospitals have been selling patient data and their questions who owns the data uh, who should be told about the data can patients opt out um, sorry there's also telemedicine so uh, in california the major health care provider is kaiser permanente and half of their doctor patient visits are now through telemedicine where the doctor and patient are not in the same room and this is particularly being used in the United States to do surgery often in remote areas. Or if a patient is, uh, needs a specialist in a remote area, we can have a, you know, a computer set up where the doctor can do a consultation. It can help with prevention, diagnosis, treatment, uh, but there are questions. There's transfer of information to patients, from patients, involving industry, government, researchers, uh, etc. Uh, there's challenges. Uh, where will the electronic records be stored? Who will see them? Who owns them? Uh, can you use the data for research? Uh, what if uh, there's a breach of confidentiality? What if it's stolen? Uh, who should get the information? What to tell patients about all the possible risks? Uh, uh, the, uh, one of the last things that President Obama did is to have new rules proposed for research, one of which is that patients can give one-time broad consent to say, uh, yes, you can use my genetic information for any research in the future you want to do. I think this is going to be controversial. Not everyone agrees with it, but clearly there are questions that come up. Computer literacy of patients vary. Uh, wealthier patients may use this more, et cetera. So there's need for more research, I think. Uh, is it better or worse in regular care? Uh, how do we use electronic information to help patient care rather than get in the way? Um, et cetera. I should add with artificial intelligence, another issue is that there are biases in algorithms. So it turned there was a study done of, uh, of looking, using artificial intelligence to help judges decide uh, what to do with um, uh, people who were brought before the judge for crimes. And it turned out there were racial biases built into the algorithms of who might then repeat a crime. And so one needs to be very careful about using artificial intelligence. So I'm going to stop in a moment and then have David speak, and then we'll have time for discussion. But basically, bioethics in the U.S. has grown, continues to grow. There are new technological advances and changes in global and domestic inequalities continue to pose challenges. The fact that we, in the U unfortunately, in the U.S., have the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. And it's important that bioethics tries to reverse that and not... Uh, end up having new technologies that continue to help the wealthy and not help the poor. Uh, I think bioethics principles and training uh, can help. As, as mentioned, we have uh, courses. We also have lots of free educational material on our website, videos. Uh, principles can get interpreted and applied in different ways, but they've been successfully used to help address challenges. I think policymakers have uh, sought to uh, reflect these principles, uh, but challenges can emerge. I think training and scholarship and education uh, of, of, of providers and the public can help. This is uh, one book in my, my genes. I recently wrote another book, The Ethics Police. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions. And again, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Merci beaucoup. Hello, my name is David Hoffman. And unlike Dr. Klitzman, um, I'm a healthcare lawyer who became a clinical ethicist kind of by accident. And lots of times people call me thinking they want ethical advice when really what they need is legal advice and vice versa. So I'm the person that the hospital or the doctor calls at two o'clock in the morning or you know, middle of the afternoon during a summer weekend or an hour ago when I was upstairs preparing for today's talk. And one of my doctors called because she didn't know whether she was allowed to disclose information about a patient that she had never seen. 
but concerning whom she had access to records. So I deal with the nitty gritty, the, the kind of nuts and bolts of the intersection of law and ethics. That's to answer Karin's uh, question from earlier. And so today I'm going to talk about um, sort of the ugly part of bioethics in America, and specifically the ugly part of the intersection of law and clinical bioethics. So not so much on the research side of things, uh, although there's some spillover, but really what's going on in America. And, and I framed my discussion today uh, around the notion of a tale of two cities, uh, not because of its references and allusions to the French Revolution, but really more to a discussion of how things were going horribly wrong as Dickens saw it in London, and how today we're experiencing a lot of the same very, very good news in bioethics and some really, frankly, unfortunate news. So this is um, uh, John Bell. Uh, there's no reason whatsoever that you should know who he is, but uh, because no one much in America knows who he is, but he's running for the um, Virginia, which is one of our 50 states, Senate. Um, and why does that matter to bioethics on a global scale? Well, because if he's elected to this one seat in the Virginia Senate, and if, as is expected, a number of seats turn to the Democratic side uh, in the Virginia House of Delegates, the Equal Rights Amendment will become part of our Constitution. It's really quite remarkable. The Equal Rights Amendment was first proposed nearly 100 years ago, and it really uh, hit its stride in terms of the legislative process in the early 1970s. And as of today, 37 states have ratified the Equal Rights Amendment, and the 38th state, which is the threshold to get over three quarters of 50, um, simple math even for a lawyer, um, will result in the Equal Rights Amendment becoming part of the United States Constitution. So here's what the Equal Rights Amendment says in substance. It's really very simple. Um, Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. A very simple pronouncement, a statement both of law and principle. And as is true in any constitutional democracy, this will have implications that frankly no one contemplated in the 70s when the process of ratifying this amendment started working its way through uh, the US Congress and then to the states. But we're going to talk later about how this could be a game changer and why it has produced so much political and legal friction that erupted literally in the last several days in a political battle that is poised to destroy the career of the current governor of Virginia, who I will tell you about in a moment. So um, 37 states have ratified, that's the purple states, so sort of the southeast corner of the United States is where it hasn't yet been ratified. And, and it's that state at the very top of the yellow, Virginia, that could tip the balance. And that's going to have profound implications. Uh, that's just a, another slide stating the language of the statute. Of, of the amendment. And what's important to understand is that this only speaks of sex. It doesn't speak of the influence on women. But as is always the case with constitutional law, uh, this matters to women. There, there's not so much of a problem of men in the United States being discriminated against. And that's not obvious to a lot of people. So there is some good news coming out of America. It's not just the political battles, which I understand you have some familiarity with in Europe, um, because Donald Trump is a attention magnet. So here, for example, is a recent development, just in the last year or so, where the federal government, which pays for medical treatment for the elderly and the poor, 
through our Medicare program and our Medicaid program, the federal government has decided that it is clinically and socially worthwhile for the government to pay for advanced care planning, which is essentially bioethics consultation about people's wishes for treatment at the end of life. That's tremendous progress for us, but of course it only covers the relatively small fraction of American citizens whose health care is paid for by the government. The rest of America participates in our commercial system of health insurance, where they only get those benefits that they specifically contract for. But still, this sets the tone in that it recognizes conversations about patients' values and their wishes is important and valuable enough to the healthcare delivery system that the government should be paying for it. On the dark side, we are moving in that commercial area of health insurance and in the Medicare system to something called value-based purchasing. Now, how do you object to value-based purchasing? Right? It sounds good. It sounds like we're paying for value. But the American Medical Association, in preparing doctors to move to this new value-based purchasing system, created an online training program. So they're training people, uh, doctors, on things such as quality reporting. That seems important. Uh, listening with empathy up on top. But in the middle, preventing physician distress and suicide. Now, it speaks volumes about the mechanics of America's convoluted healthcare system, that we have some people insured through a government program, many more insured commercially, and we have to worry about the changes that are going on resulting in physician suicide. So file that thought away for a few minutes. It gets worse. We have 50 states, as I'm sure you all are aware at some level, and because we do not have much in the way of national law that governs and regulates bioethical practices, we have an enormous range of behavior. So here in Arizona, this woman uh, was ordered to turn her embryos over to her husband because she wanted to have babies. She was diagnosed with cancer, couldn't have any more children, couldn't get her husband to agree to let her use the embryos. So they went to a judge in the course of their divorce proceeding. The judge said, well, if you can't agree on who gets the embryos, I'm going to order that they be turned over to a complete stranger, anyone out there who is willing to adopt the embryos, implant them in somebody's uterus to produce a baby. That was the court decision. The legislature in Arizona, one of the less progressive states of our 50 states, said, no, no, no. Um, we're not going to direct that the embryos be turned over to a complete stranger if the couple can't agree. Rather, through legislation, we're going to direct that the embryos go to whichever of the individuals who created the embryos, the progenitors, we're going to direct that those embryos go to whichever of the divorcing parents wants to bring them to term. And this, on its face, seems like a move to encourage procreation. But just below the surface, the legal analysis yields an establishment of personhood rights for embryos and a predisposition by the state of Arizona anyway to produce more babies. So whatever resolution of a dispute in a divorce proceeding will facilitate more babies being born, that's what the state of Arizona wants to see done. This is a dramatic, dramatic departure from decades of precedent in really every state in the union, 
that encouraged the right of either of the progenitors to object to having paternity imposed upon them or maternity, such that if either of the parents didn't want the embryos to be made available for um, development into a human, that either of the, of the spouses could, in effect, veto the decision to bring those embryos to human form, uh, this takes exactly the opposite approach. So this, this, this piece of legislation is currently uh, subject to appeal, and we are all waiting with bated breath to see how that will turn out, because it will dramatically affect whether couples are even willing to produce surplus embryos in the process of trying to achieve um, childbirth through in vitro fertilization. So this law, which creates this right to claim embryos over the objection of your, of your spouse, uh, is literally called a revised statute for um, uh, relating to the dissolution of marriage. So this is part of the law of the state of Arizona. This became law just a, a few months ago, um, specifically intending to manage, to regulate the dissolution of marriage where there are frozen embryos involved. And what the law says is that um, this bill dictates which party in a divorce will have rights to frozen embryos. The parent who would, quote, allow the in vitro embryos to develop to birth would be awarded the rights. The other parent would not have to pay child support for a resulting child. So it is the maximum effort that this state's legislature could employ to facilitate more embryos achieving personhood by ascribing rights that we normally associate with actually individual humans post-birth to the embryos. We don't have to go through the details. Suffice it to say, um, if the court in Arizona, if, 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 yes, if the Supreme Court in Arizona upholds the action of the legislature, we will have two dramatically, really diametrically opposed standards for the disposition of frozen embryos in the case of divorce, and that is going to fundamentally change the way people approach in vitro fertilization and assisted reproduction. But there's good news in America. Something that is going on right now that is very encouraging as a step toward expanding the rights of American citizens is the initiative to promote the rights of patients with advanced Alzheimer's to leave behind a written advance directive saying that when they reach the most extreme phase of Alzheimer's disease, where their dementia leaves them practically vegetables, that they ought to have the legal ability to direct that they will not be fed by mouth orally anymore. This is an extension of a well-established both legal and clinical right to refuse any treatment. And that goes back to the law that was the foundation for the findings at the, at the Nuremberg doctors' trials, the notion that every person of adult years and sound mind has a basic right to control what's done to their body. So this I would put in the category of good news. Back to bad news. Uh, this is a court decision in the state of Arkansas where a woman Annie Bynum was found guilty of concealing childbirth. And the specific act that she was convicted of was not telling her mother that she had experienced a stillbirth, a child born dead. And she was sentenced to six years in jail by a jury in Arkansas and that decision obviously needed to be appealed. And it was set aside, and the uh, conviction was only vacated because the appellate court determined that the judge had allowed prejudicial evidence, the fact that she had previously had an abortion, to influence the jury to conclude that somehow, even though there was no proof at all, somehow she was the cause of her stillbirth. 
and that resulted in a six-year prison sentence. Pleased to report that on appeal, this conviction was vacated, and the prosecutor decided that they would not retry her, which they could have done. Instead, she was merely um, fined for trying to make arrangements for the child that was stillborn uh, to be put up for adoption. So bad start, good outcome in the long run. We don't have to go through the legal arguments. I put this in the slide so that you could have the information available. But the fact of the concealment spoke to the very broad, really reckless language of the statute, which said, if you conceal your childbirth from anyone, even if you have disclosed it to a great many other people, you have committed a crime for which you can be sentenced to up to six years in jail. The state tried to argue on the appeal that, well, this was a legitimate exercise of discretion by the state of Arkansas, and that the fact that she had had an abortion, Annie Bynum had had an abortion before, and was therefore predisposed to end pregnancies was some evidence that she must have done something to bring about this stillbirth. It's really kind of horrifying when you look at this from a technical, clinical, medical perspective, but there you have it. Arkansas, in case anyone's curious, is the state that sits right on top of Texas. Oop. So these are just a couple of examples of a pretty broad attack on the discretion that women are allowed to exercise, which actually produced an entire op-ed series in the New York Times which highlighted the fact that more and more laws are treating a fetus as a person and a woman as less of one, as states change their pregnancy laws to turn them into crimes. And so some of these crimes are fetal assault, depraved heart murder, which is a very technical crime, delivery of a controlled substance while pregnant, chemical endangerment of fetus, drinking alcohol during pregnancy, for example, even though small quantities of alcohol are considered medically entirely safe, manslaughter for the death of a fetus, second degree murder, feticide, a relatively new crime, uh, child abuse, reckless injury to a child in utero, and the list went on and on all of which came under the heading of this op-ed section by the editorial board, A Woman's Rights, and it's available online. I urge you to take a look at it if you're interested in understanding, in a broad sense, what is going on at the state level, only in certain states, mostly in that sort of southern slice of, of the United States. This is an op-ed documentary that is part of that series about Annie Bynum, talking about how her stillbirth became a crime. And then we get to current events. So this was literally last week. The state of New York, my home state, the home of Columbia University, came to the conclusion that there needed to be state action by states that support a woman's right to choose in order to protect people in New York from any repeal of the Roe v. Wade decision, which is the basis for women having the right to access to an abortion, at least in the first two trimesters. This extended that law to say that a doctor and a patient could exercise discretion in the third trimester, months seven through nine, to end a pregnancy if the pregnancy is a danger to the woman's life or health. For that legislative action by our governor, Andrew Cuomo, um, he's been threatened with excommunication. He's a lifelong Catholic. It's a decision uh, that he has personally said rattled him because he considers his faith very important to him. But this is the state of the battle in legal circles to enforce personhood rights for fetuses and limit the ability of women to control what they do to their bodies. And then there was um, this law in Virginia, 
which tried to do essentially the same thing that New York did, and as a retaliation and as a political effort to suppress the adoption of the New York style law in Virginia, the people who oppose abortion rights, which go by the moniker the uh, pro-life community or the anti-abortion community, and we, we quibble over terminology, um, they attacked the law as legalizing infanticide. Now, infanticide is the killing of a child after delivery, which they argue the decision not to resuscitate a child immediately after birth, which is a decision that doctors and patients make as a matter of their own clinical judgment and as a matter of conscience, that that decision to withhold treatment is the equivalent of murdering that child. This is obviously very inflammatory language. It's representative of the environment that we are dealing with in the United States, where there's dramatic tension and difference in what priorities ought to be embodied in law and what issues should be left to people's individual conscience and their deliberations with their doctors. Now, you may have heard about the governor of Virginia being um, uh, disclosed as having had an overtly racist photograph on his page in his college yearbook. What's significant about this is that the timing of this was a direct connection to the effort by the Virginia legislature to pass a law which extended the discretion that patients and doctors could exercise regarding abortion. And there are those who might say that it was just a coincidence that this came out the day after the Virginia debate over this law. I would suggest that if you believe that, um, come talk to me afterwards. I'd like to sell you a bridge in Brooklyn. Back to some good news. Take a deep breath. Um, we are just starting to have a discussion in the medical community in the United States about the implications of the artificial external uterus and the notion that this is going to fundamentally change the way men and women interact about reproduction. It is a bizarre conversation on the level of science fiction, except, of course, it's true, right? This is the artificial external uterus that was developed at the University of Pennsylvania, and that's a sheep inside. Um, but there is no technical or medical reason why that couldn't be a human baby. And those of us who pay close attention to the subject think that that is the greater likelihood sooner rather than later at least initially as a bridge technology for women whose babies develop distress prior to the point of viability, about 24 weeks. So this is part of our future. And we're starting to think about how should we manage this new set of both opportunities and responsibilities. This was a conference that I spoke at just a few weeks ago on the art of parenthood, and my topic was ectogenesis, the artificial external uterus. So this is something that we're starting to look at. It's not clear to me that this is a uh, widespread conversation, but it really needs to be. And so I feel good about being part of that conversation. What are the implications of ectogenesis? Well, um, parenthood rights versus personhood rights will fundamentally change. There will be new constraints on fetal advocacy because they will no longer be tied to the woman's control over her own body. The access to the technology will create yet another economic divide within American society because, of course, in America, while we um, scoff at socialized medicine systems, we ration care. We just do it on the basis of what you can afford to pay for. 
Now people who will be able to afford to pay for ectogenesis will derive certain benefits that people who can't afford uh, to pay for it will not be able to enjoy. Lots of things change for the children. Birthdays can be predetermined, right? You can decide precisely when you want your child to be born. Uh, it will largely eliminate the problem in the medical complication of premature birth. Expanded prenatal surgery options, think about it. I mean, prenatal surgery now in utero is remarkable. But the opportunities to do more prenatal surgery while the fetus is in an artificial external uterus, um, you don't have any of the risk to the mother. So prenatal surgery will be another economic divider between classes of citizens in the United States, less so than in societies that operate a system of socialized medicine. And of course, um, we will effectively eliminate the constraints on family size because you can have children throughout the course of the parent's lifetime, right? There, there won't be any of the biological constraints. So that's interesting. Um, for the parents, uh, women are liberated from exclusive responsibility for child rearing. Um, but on the other hand, women lose control of child rearing, so that's a double-edged sword. And there are a whole variety of other implications that we're starting to talk about. And I think everyone needs to start to talk about this because the technology will catch up with the uh, clinical opportunities very soon. Not clear that we're going to be ready to deal with the ethical implications in the same time frame. But we still have problems. This was Thursday. This was in the New York Times. Uh, Trump, you may know, is our president at the moment. And um, Pence, who's the vice president, will lead the GOP seizure of the late-term abortion issue as a campaign issue in the upcoming presidential elections in 2020. This is weaponizing decisions that legislatures make about what the extent of a woman's right to control her body ought to be. And this is where things are heading in the United States, and, and not in a good way. On the flip side, we were on the verge of several states literally making it impossible to find a doctor who would do an abortion. And Justice Alito, one of our much more conservative justices on our national Supreme Court, said, time out, I'm not going to let that law go into effect because we need to look at the implications of this. So that says something about the separation between our legislative actors at the state and federal level and the actions of the federal Supreme Court, which though it is now a much more conservative Supreme Court, nonetheless is constrained by precedent and the obligation to protect the rule of law. That's the good, bad, and the ugly of what's going on in the United States. Much of this just literally in the last several weeks. We have lots more challenges than we have positive opportunities because of our political environment. But we're doing some things well that you might want to think about pursuing here in Europe. So I'll break now. And um, Bob, do we want to take questions? Sure. Thank you. How do you take into sorry, how do you take into consideration the the fetus interest. I mean, it's not the same to grow up in a plastic bag. I'm sorry, I'm not a, a, a doctor. <laughs> and to grow up in, in a human being. So let me answer the question this way, because it's a very important question. But as is true so often in bioethics, though the technology is new, the ethical questions are really ancient. Right? At core, when a woman and a man, the two progenitors, the persons who supply the sperm and the egg, when they make a decision to either utilize an artificial external uterus or not to 
procreate the traditional way, um, they're making a decision for their child based on their values and what they think is in the child's best interest. Early on in the rollout of the artificial external uterus, there will be some serious questions about the safety and the effectiveness and whether it's even necessary. But when the artificial external uterus is available to remove a baby from the mother's womb at a point where it is not viable independently so that it can be nurtured and given prenatal surgery and all of the other interventions that are possible, all of a sudden the uh, artificial external uterus is almost obligatory because the same people who are arguing that couples should be forced to bring their frozen embryos to term in a divorce context, um, the obligation to do all that can be done to safeguard your unborn child will become a responsibility of parenthood. And to not do that would be bad parenting, just as it is to drink wine while you're pregnant. I know that's not considered a problem in France, for sure. And frankly, <laughs> not so much of a problem in the United States either. But all of these actions, uh, literally, women have been charged with endangering their fetus by engaging in aggressive physical activity or driving in circumstances where they wind up in a car accident. So we need to look at this use of the artificial external uterus in the larger context of how much discretion ought the progenitors be allowed to exercise in their role as parents. In the United States, I can tell you, we have always deferred to parents in almost every circumstance. So all of those instances of criminal prosecution that were outlined in the New York Times uh, editorial series, um, all of that's a relatively new intrusion into the domain of judgment that has been treated as exclusively the propriety of the parents. Thank that's you. my answer. Thank you. It's, it's very interesting because you, you if I, I understood properly, that means it cannot be a project by itself to have a baby in an artificial womb. It, is, it will always be a situation where we're using this scientific uh, tool to help getting through a situation which would otherwise end in a baby's death or a fetus death, if I'm correct. That will be the first stage. There's no question and that. And then, then, of course, you can see it differently. Right. The technology. My reaction was just, are we going to have babies like this lamp in a plastic bag? That was or mass very, produced. In other words, it may yeah, be in the future people but, say, I'll have 10 of them. Mm -hmm. If it's just a matter of having, as you put it, aptly plastic bags. I mean, and of course, one issue with technology is that once it's out of the bag, no pun intended. Uh, <laughs> it takes on a life of its own. Uh, no pun intended. You're right. Uh, yes, right. The, the interesting part of this is really when we get to the point in the technology, and this will not happen right away, but it will happen eventually inescapably, when we get to the point where creating a baby in an artificial external womb is the safer better process from the baby's perspective, then all of a sudden it becomes potentially a kind of child neglect to not use the artificial external uterus and the desire to have, quote unquote, natural childbirth, intrauterine childbirth, will itself fall victim to the argument that that's a kind of neglect. It's mind boggling. Well, I think the problem is, so one is there'll be a cost involved. And so it may be the case that not everyone, not every woman, let's say women, there, there are a group of women who cannot use their own womb to have a child. Uh, those who can afford an artificial womb may be able to do so, whereas there may be some who won't. I think what you were suggesting, too, is for the child, is there something about being born naturally, for lack of a better term, that'll be lost? And there may be a need to do research on that. In mm -hmm. other words, are children who, is it something about a, a mother who carries a child the term herself, 
does she feel differently about her child, perhaps more attached to the child, let's say? Again, these are questions one can ask. You could argue, no, there are women who adopt, and that's not an issue, but... No, well, I was thinking also about the level of exchange that uh, a fetus has with the mother's womb. Mm -hmm. And this you cannot replace. There will always be something that it cannot be described fully. It's, mm -hmm. I don't know, the temperature, the, the smell, the, the noise of the, of the, the mother talking, mm -hmm. and etc. And I mean, artificial will never be at the same level, of course. And, and that, especially not at first. So yeah. I'm urging my students who are interested in this whole subject to reread The Island of Dr. Moreau by H.G. Wells, because it speaks to the moral status of creatures that aren't traditionally defined as human. Remember in, in the novel, um, uh, creatures that were created from other animals uh, were pseudo-human, but were not given recognition as human. and. If we start thinking about the products of this form of technological uh, production of children as being something less than a child who is born from a uterus, we have to confront what the moral status of these new kinds of creatures are, especially if because of the absence of the woman's heartbeat and hearing yeah. voices and all of those factors, these children come out with behavior that's different than we are accustomed to. Probably so. Mm. Yeah. No, it's fascinating. I want to ask a couple of questions. First of all, I kind of made the link between uh, maybe the parent idea of a parent will change, like who owned the genetic material that made that baby. Maybe that will be the idea of parenthood. And my second question, what will it mean for uh, like trans people and uh, gay people that now is widely variation in different countries? Like, like Japan uh, recently uh, pushed for a law that uh, for st sterilization of trans people um, um, pre, um, pre transition. So what do you think? So in the oh, U.S., sorry. there are uh, trans people who uh, do use assisted reproductive technologies, and there are uh, uh, assisted reproductive technology doctors who will work with trans people. Often what happens is they will have trans people freeze their eggs or sperm before undergoing transition so they're able to have children. Um, but it is an uphill battle for a lot of trans individuals who want to become parents because a lot of doctors kind of can't quite figure it out that you know the whichever member of the couple is now transitioned and so it's now two women and uh, so or, or whatever two men and uh, but there are doctors who, who work with trans people there's still a lot of discrimination against people trans individuals uh, but many do have kids and I think a, a lot is sort of freezing of embryos um, and uh, remind me, your first question is, what will it mean to parenthood in terms of who gives the biological material? So I'm giving, it, this is, I'm giving a talk about this on Wednesday. Is the talk about, quote, designing babies is about uses of assisted reproductive technology specifically. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, work that's been done. And yes, the definition of what is a parent changes. So for instance, there are uh, children who created where uh, one individual gave the sperm, one gave the eggs, another carries the baby, uh, and they may or may not be the people raising the child. In other words, one of the people may, may be two men, for instance, in which one is giving sperm, one, someone else gives an egg, someone else, yet another person is giving a womb. So you can have multiple people involved. Um, the I think it's a challenge if people work it out. I think there is also, uh, Studies that show, for instance, that uh, Susan Galambuk at Cambridge University uh, has done some work, I've worked with her a bit, on children born of lesbian mothers. And it turns out that they do much better on average than the children born of heterosexual parents. And the reason is because if a lesbian couple decide to have a child together, they're very committed to raising a child. They really want to do this. 
whereas a lot of heterosexual couples just end up with a child. You know, the woman gets pregnant, they decide to get married, have the child, they don't really want the child. Uh, and so, versus, you know, the lesbian couple really, really wants to have this and they're very loving parents. So it gets, there are complicated dynamics, but people are able to adjust. I, one thing that comes out of that research, though, and this is relevant to some of the French law, um, in terms of anonymity, and this is a preview of what I'll be talking about Wednesday, is it turns out that children, especially when they get older, really want to know who their biological parent is. And the same thing has happened with adoption, at least in the United States, whereas for many years, if a child was adopted, the adoption records were closed, so the child would never be able to find out who the biological parents were, and it was decided by the courts at a certain point that it's in the child's best interest to know, and so too now with uh, gamete donors, a lot of parents do not want to tell the child. Let's say there's a couple, and, and I should say 10% of all heterosexual couples are infertile, they can't have a child. Uh, and so, uh, either because of male factors or female factors, and so if they have an um, uh, egg donor or a sperm donor in the U.S., they do, you generally do not want to tell the child that, guess what, I'm not really your father because they're afraid the child will love them less, or I'm not really your mother. Turns out the children want to know. Uh, the children do better when they're told because otherwise the aunt tells them at some point or someone, they, they find that on their own and they feel deceived. Uh, but people, and that people do want to know who they're, they're able to, t to process the information that yes, you know, this, these are my loving parents, but yes, this was the sperm donor and I can get genetic information, et cetera. Let me give a, a legal preface in answer to your first question to Bob's presentation on, on Wednesday, which I'm sorry I'm going to miss myself. Um, like it or not, I have to get back to teach. Like it or not, historically, we have treated the genetic material supplied by the two progenitors, the male and female, um, under the law of property, which seems sort of heartless, but it's worked well as a legal construct so that um, the general rule, as I mentioned earlier, is that if either of the progenitors decides because of divorce or any other circumstance that they no longer want their biologic material to materialize into a human person, that they have that right, it's essentially a right of veto. Um, that changes dramatically when there's no longer of necessity the time gap between when the embryo is created and when it's implanted in either a human uterus or an artificial external uterus. And by the way, we haven't even talked about the more complicated circumstance of the artificial internal uterus or the uterus transplant, each of which has its own interesting complications. But because we have historically a applied a property right analysis to the biologic material, and notwithstanding the fact that a fetus, up until the moment before delivery, is clearly human, it is not as the law has, has defined that organism, it's not a person. And it's all well and good to describe an in utero human organism as a person, but all that does is create a homonym problem because now we're using the same word to describe that human organism in utero and ex utero. And there are good reasons related to the woman's right to control what is done to her body to distinguish between the use of the term parenthood with regard to an in utero human organism versus one that is already delivered and is therefore, by definition, a baby. Oh, thank you very much. Can I ask another question, a follow-up? So because now I'm in the dilemma, and maybe you can help me solve it, uh, where countries like Sweden are completely banning surrogacy and completely banning on the principle of uh, the human body is not for sale and all the horrible examples like people who misuse this term. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, uh, shared parenthood for lesbian couples, for example, it contradicts with that principle. So what's the solution <laughs> that you might propose? So in the United States, so there's, there's, um, there's uh, 
three kinds of surrogacy. There is traditional surrogacy where a woman will get impregnated by a man and the woman will provide the egg and the womb. Then there is um, gestational surrogacy uh, where uh, the embryo will be implanted, so it's not the woman's egg. And there, there are two kinds. There's paid and unpaid. So in Great Britain, for instance, and in many countries, there is, quote, unpaid gestational surrogacy, which is often a sister. Let's say a woman can't, something's wrong with her womb. Her sister may say, well, I'm willing to carry the embryo for you. No money exchanges hands. The US, in several states, but not all, and notably uh, doing this is California, uh, there is paid gestational surrogacy, where you could pay someone to carry your embryo to a child. And so there are actresses, Sarah Jessica Parker, for instance, said she didn't want to, you know, have, she wanted a baby, she didn't want to have it change her figure, so she paid someone to do it. Uh, there are gay couples who do this, obviously. Uh, and this is a large issue we'll also be talking about Wednesday. Um, the, uh, it's controversial in the, in, in the United States. So in New York, for instance, it's legal in California. Uh, it's illegal in New York. Uh, and uh, um, there are uh, uh, some states allow it, uh, and what they're actually allowing is that the contract, the legal contract drawn up between the gestational mother and the uh, eventual parents, that that contract will hold up in court. And particularly the issue is if the mother, after nine months of carrying the child, decides to keep the child, um, in several states, in most states, the court will decide that she has a right to keep the child. In California, for instance, the court would say, no, you sign the contract that the child is going to belong to the this other couple. You have to give the child up. So that's the difference. So um, you know, there are concerns that, and this is a hot topic at the moment. So you have, uh, in New York, for instance, uh, I've been in discussions with state legislators about this, and there which of note is that there, there is um, pushback from two groups. On the one hand, you have uh, conservatives, uh, particularly uh, people involved with the Catholic Church or right-wing religious groups who say that this is morally wrong. And then uh, you have opposition from feminists who say that, uh, that this is uh, you know, uh, co-modification of the female body, et cetera, et cetera. It's going to be poor women who will be carrying children. Of course, there was the famous book, uh, Margaret Atwood's book, uh, The Handmaid's Tale, that was sort of about this kind of topic. So you have opposition, interestingly, from these two groups, feminists and the Catholic religious right, who normally don't agree. So, um, uh, so you know, I, I do think, I think that, number one, there needs to be more research on this. So it's, at the moment, my sense is that it's not poor women who are doing this. So I think the notion that you're going to create a poor class, that need not be the case. I think, though, number one is you want to find out what the experience is of women who've done this. Do they feel? Because another argument is that if a woman says women earn $100,000 or $120,000 US for carrying someone's child, well, there are couples I know who've decided you know, they find a woman in New York who says, you know, gee, I'm just sitting at home. Uh, I'd love $100,000 US to just carry someone's baby, 120000 US. That, to me, is a good deal. I'm willing to do it. Uh, and um, so a woman like that, I think there are women who feel this is, you know, if I work as a maid, I'm going to get $30,000 here. I'm going to carry a child. I get $120,000. I could feed my kids. I can live better. Whatever it is, that's her right to make that decision. I think we need to see to have research done to see do women who underdo this, do they look back and feel that was a good decision? Do they look back and say that was a terrible thing? And so we need more information. A lot of the ethical dimensions of this discussion really relate right back to the organ transplantation ethics that have been a work in progress for the last almost 50 years now. Um, I would suggest that when a woman decides, in effect, to rent out her uterus, um, it is a less morally objectionable practice than somebody deciding to sell their kidney or liver, portion of their liver. Or, and this is really scary science fiction, 
Um, a woman could sell her uterus. Think about it. Because we can now transplant uteruses, and this is a not unheard of practice today, uh, we have to prepare for the event where someone who wants to have the experience of physically carrying their child will buy someone else's uterus. These are all very new questions which will be answered by very old principles. Thank Except you. I should say, we now in the U.S. do not allow buying and selling of organs. So currently, she would not be able to sell the uterus. But that is going to change soon, I predict. It may, it may yes, right. Because there's a lot of sale of organs going on inappropriately and without authorization. I won't say illegally, but you could argue it's illegal. And, and that is one compelling argument for why the practice should be decriminalized. Because right now, the only people who are being sanctioned by the enforcement of the law are the people who are obeying the law. So it's yeah. a big question. We, uh, it's very interesting Thank because very uh, during the bioethics forum in, in France, um, the issue of assisted reproduction was debated, um, but not the surrogacy. So it's, uh, in France, it's taboo. It's, it was excluded of, uh, uh, of the ninth thematics of the uh, bioethics forum uh, last, na last, na last year. Um, do you want to? Uh, yes, Fabrice? Thank you, Robert and David, for these excellent presentations. Um, I would have a question for Robert, um, linking the beginning and the end of your presentation. You began with research ethics, and you finished with genetics and artificial intelligence. Are you concerned in the US with co communication ethics about research? I mean about kind of false hopes uh, you can have about some tr trials. Or I was thinking maybe now we are more um, pr prudent with genetics, but during years and years we invested billions of euros and dollars in this research. And now we are g going to invest hundreds of billions in research on artificial intelligence. And do you think that it is um, a work for ethicists or bioethicists to, be, to make cautious about these investments um, because they were clearly false promises about genetics, and maybe they are now false promises about yes. artificial intelligence. Yes, great question. So, um, so yes, one job of bioethicists is to bring um, reality to the situation, and in general, with with therapy, with advances in um, uh, in various fields, in treatments, et cetera, there tends to be a lot of hype, a lot of uh, high expectations. This is going to be the cure, et cetera, for all kinds of things, and then the reality is found about you know either that uh, the the a treatment or intervention in fact has some application, but it's more limited, and here are the areas, or the reality is more complicated. Um, genetics, I think what happened is that uh, people did not know. So scientists thought there would be the, the fat gene, the alcohol gene. There's a colleague of mine, uh, Peter Conrad at, uh, at Tufts, who wrote an article called, Why Has the Gene for Alcoholism Been Discovered Five Times? Mm -hmm. And it turns out that five times in the New York Times, there was a headline, Gene for Alcoholism Discovered, and then buried somewhere later, it says, well, no, that was on that one sample, et cetera. And so there is this problem of hype. Of course, another problem with that is so-called, quote, therapeutic misconception, where people in research, research subjects, if we tell them this is a randomized study, you're either going to get this or the placebo, it's a flip of a coin, they think that the person in the white coat who, in the hospital who gives them the drug you ask them, why did you getting that drug? They'll say, well, because the doctor thinks that's the best one for me. So people don't understand that research is different than the notion that we all have, that all cultures have of a healer, of a shaman, someone who's going to do what's best for us. 
artificial intelligence, yes, there's a lot of hype. And again, for similarly, there's a lot of business money. There's people, uh, businesses say that think they're going to make a lot of money in this. They're putting a lot of money. This is going to solve the problem. It's going to have artificial intelligence is going to cure, take care of everything. Uh, the reality, as I understand it, is that uh, as in all technology and tools, it's how we use it as one. There are inherent biases. So the problem is the, the data in the United States is often based on, uh, uh, is biased. It may have very few people of color, or maybe it's too many people of color, or it's more men, or it's more women, or people live in urban areas, not rural areas, so it's not always representative of the data, or it's people who use the internet a lot, which is not typical of everyone. Um, and uh, uh, so there'll be a lot of hype, a lot of false expectations. The other problem is that uh, we have colleagues who argue that we're very vulnerable right now because we're not ready for this uh, artificial intelligence, which has a lot of Silicon Valley money and entrepreneurs involved. It's going to say, "We'll, you know, to doctors, you know, we'll replace you. We'll, you know, let the algorithm decide what is best for patients." And studies show that there are a lot of false positives, false negatives, et cetera. So it's an area that is ripe. The a, a problem is that it's sort of a black box. So even people who work with algorithms don't know what the algorithm is doing. Uh, and so the answer will be, and this is a problem, in other words, it may be when you go see your doctor, they'll say, well, you should take this pill. Why? Well, that's what the computer said to do. Why the computer said to do that? And, and you don't know the, the data may be bad data, there may be errors, so these are big problems. And there's an added legal dimension to this, which is who's responsible for the failure of the artificial intelligence system. For example, uh, people are trying to teach computers how to read x-rays. And you can have one party responsible for the effectiveness of the system on the first day that it's utilized. But at the end of the hundredth day, the system itself has learned. That's the whole point of artificial intelligence. It's the difference between an al algorithm that is static but gains experience versus one that is evolving. So on the hundredth day that the system is operating, who's responsible if the computer reads something as a normal finding and it isn't, and there's no human being evaluating that diagnostic decision? That's a problem we are not yet prepared to answer. Great question. So many thanks for your presence. I, I think uh, we stop now. Uh, just Robert, you you made the teasing for <laughs> for Wednesday, and um, the conference will take place at six. It's, six it's really a shame to yes, yes. because you you have to to, to go back uh, in uh, in Columbia University, but it was really a pleasure to uh, to have you to have you both. Uh, um, through this conference. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, and thank you for coming.